This is the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The records should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys, Ms. Brady, Mr. King, Ms. Higgs, Ms. Nelson, and Ms. Pengler. And the people are represented by Mr. Brockler, Mr. Orman, uh, Ms. Pearson, uh, Ms. Stitch McGuire, Mr. Edson, and Mr. Edwards. We are outside the presence of the jury. I'm going to bring in juror number 378 first to make sure she's feeling well enough to proceed today, okay? Let's bring her in, please. The record should reflect that juror number 378 is now in the courtroom. Good morning. Hi. Are you feeling any better than you were on Friday? I'm feeling or much Thursday better. Or Thursday last week, yeah, Friday. Friday, Friday. Don't yeah. mess with my head. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was testing you. <laughs> what day is today? Um, Monday. Very good. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling much better. I don't sound better yet, but I'm feeling much better. Okay. Are you well enough to proceed? Yes. You think you'll be able to concentrate on, on the proceedings? Yes. Okay. If at any point you, you start feeling sick or you start feeling like you're not able to concentrate completely on what's happening in the proceedings or you need a break, uh, would you please let us know? Okay. Okay? All right. Um, I think uh, um, just because I don't want anybody else to get sick, we might move you to another chair temporarily. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay. I just don't want, you know, I can't have everybody getting sick. Uh, so I hope you understand. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to hear you're feeling better. You know, I can't have everybody getting sick. Uh, so I hope you understand. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to hear you're feeling better. The record should reflect that juror number 378 has now exited the courtroom. I think what we'll do is maybe have her seat, uh, have her um, take a seat in seat number eight, all the way at the top, uh, because there's an empty seat next to that one. And, and that way, I think it will hopefully alleviate some of the concerns that uh, anyone else may have on the jury. Uh, frankly, we don't want anyone to be getting sick either. Um, the added benefit to that is away from the lawyers and from me that she can be. <laughs> so that's an added benefit, I suppose. Uh, I don't want any of you getting sick either. So, uh, And I certainly don't want to get sick. So. Uh, We'll, we'll proceed in that fashion. Is there any other record that the people want me to make with respect to juror number 378, or are there any other questions that the people think the court should ask? The only record I would make is that she looked a lot better today um, and seemed a lot better today, and we're not asking for any additional questions. All right. What about on behalf of the defense? Ms. Brady? And no further questions of 378. Okay. All right, and any, any requests that you're making of the court at this time, Ms. Brady? No, sir. And you agree that we should proceed with her today based on the record made? Yes. And the people agree as well? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we'll proceed. I, I do think uh, that um, she's better. She's telling us she feels better. Uh, she seems better. Um, she still doesn't look uh, back to normal, but uh, she, she seems better than she did Friday, and she's saying that she, she feels a lot better. So we'll proceed. Um, any updates on D-TR-234 and 236, Ms. Higgs? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Your Honor, if I may approach? Yes. Why don't you show them to the people real quick, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And I can just leave it here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I apologize. That's okay. All right. So we have D-TR-234 and 236 back. 
and, and their photographs. So any record or any request that anybody wants to make with respect to these two exhibits? Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Ms. Hayes, anything else from you on this? No, sir. Okay, great. Are the parties ready for the jury? Are the people ready for the jury? Ms. Ms. Tish McGuire would like to address the court, Your Honor. All right, Ms. Tish McGuire. Thanks, Your Honor. I have two brief issues. One, I just wanted to let the court know that we have some Spanish-speaking victims here who will be here with an interpreter. So I just want the court to know that if there's noise from the victim side, it's just interpreter translations. The second is that the people originally filed P83, which was our disclosures for victim impact. And I talked to the defense this morning. When we filed our pleading, we had said basically this person we anticipate testifying, but alternatively, these three other people may testify. Um, for some of those people, we do have to take the alternative people. And I did alert Ms. Brady to that this morning. And so far, she said she has no objections to that procedures. But I wanted to ask the court for leave to file a supplemental disclosure just to alert the court exactly who will be testifying. Is there any objection to that, Ms. Brady? No, thank you. Okay, great. That would be helpful. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. That and, I, and I should clarify, if we get to phase three. Uh, absolutely. This is only uh, if we get to phase three, otherwise it's not an issue. Um, and are you still anticipating calling approximately 15 witnesses in terms of uh, victim impact evidence if there is a phase three? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Is there anything on behalf of the defense at this time before I bring the jury in, Ms. Nelson? Yes, Your Honor. We would like to request that the court conduct a Harper inquiry of the jury regarding the uh, shooting in a movie theater in Lafayette, Louisiana, and the media coverage surrounding that event. The shooting occurred on Thursday evening at about 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time, and coverage of the event was just beginning to unfold on Friday morning when we were all here and then juror 378 was sick and the jury was dismissed and sent home for Friday and the weekend. Since that time, particularly on Friday and then and continuing on into the weekend, there has been a significant amount of media coverage about that event. And many of the articles have mentioned not only um, this case in terms of uh, describing the event in Louisiana as some sort of copycat incident of this case, noting that it occurred uh, you know, nearly to the day on the three-day anniversary or a few days after the three-day anniversary of the event in this case. Uh, and in addition, a number of the victims from this case have been uh, asked for commentary and um, have been quoted in media articles and have also given interviews um, offering support to the victims of the Louisiana shooting. All of which is, of course, perfectly appropriate, Your Honor, but the concern is that, that jurors may have been um, inadvertently exposed to facts outside the record, uh, victim impact evidence, et cetera, contained within the media reports of these other cases, or excuse, of this other case. So we, we think that the standard set out by Harper versus People, which is 817 P. 2nd 77, uh, Colorado 1991, has, we've, has been established, which is the first question for the court, is whether coverage has a potential for unfair prejudice. I think there are really two concerns here. One is that the jury has simply been exposed to information about this other case, and that may have impacted their thinking in some way about the appropriate penalty uh, in this case, given that some media outlets are um, claiming that this is sort of a copycat incident um, r related to this case. I mean, feel some sense of blame on Mr. Holmes's part for inspiring a copycat shooting in Louisiana. Uh, and then the second concern, of course, is that they may have been inadvertently exposed to um, information about this case it's outside the record contained within the media articles about the Louisiana shooting. So because of the close parallels and the timing of that case, the fact that we're in a critical part of the sentencing proceeding and heightened reliability applies under the Eighth Amendment and Article 2, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution, we would ask that the court first conduct a general poll of the jury, ask a general question of them whether they've been exposed to any media coverage about an event that occurred in Louisiana on Thursday evening, and ask for a show of hands if jurors, if anyone responds affirmatively, then under Harper, 
The second step would be to um, qu individually question uh, the jurors about the nature of such coverage and whether that has had any impact on their ability to be fair and impartial. Are you requesting that I ask the group in general about um, the, in the shooting at the theater in Louisiana? Do you want me to be that specific? Because there may be some people who haven't been exposed. And so I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't think we want to be that specific. If they've had exposure, I think it will, it, a, a more general question than that, an event that occurred in Louisiana on Thursday evening will probably, if people have had exposure, they will know what the court is talking about if right. the court makes it that general. Right. So that would be the request. Okay. And I think that is more appropriate. What's the people's position? Obviously, I just submit to your judgment on this. I would note that while the horrific events in Louisiana did occur in a movie theater, there's a lot of, and, have, and involved, obviously involved a shooting, the, there's a big difference between what happened there and here, and it is, I don't see any indication from any of the stuff I've read, although I have not been following it closely. I've had other things to occupy my time. Um, the, there, there are just a lot of differences, but counsel's correct in the fact that some of the media coverage did involve uh, reference to this case and interviews with people who are associated with this case, uh, witnesses, victims, and so forth. So um, I don't think it's inappropriate for the court to inquire. I would note for the record that I heard when the court gave its advisements on Friday, in addition to, um, and maybe this wasn't something new, but I noticed it because I knew about the Lafayette case, something where the court said, don't read anything about this case or any case like it, which I don't know if the court was thinking about the Lafayette case when, he, when it said that, uh, but the, the jury was actually instructed not to read articles about other shootings, or especially in a theater. Uh, although not directly, I think that it was covered by that instruction from the court and that admonishment. Other than that, Your Honor, I, I obviously trust your judgment on this, and I don't have any specific advice or requests for the court. All right, thank you. In the past, I have been giving an admonishment in terms of not doing any research about the case or any case like it, but on Friday, I extended that language about other cases like it to the specific admonishments related to media coverage or reading news reports, uh, uh, hearing information from others, uh, that kind of thing. So, and I did that specifically because of the Louisiana shooting. Obviously, that was Friday morning. That was the first opportunity that I had to say that uh, after the shooting. But uh, it's possible that some of the jurors may have been exposed to coverage of the, Louis the Louisiana shooting uh, on Thursday night and maybe early Friday morning. So, um, it's also possible that despite my admonishment, uh, admonishments on Friday, the jurors were still exposed after Friday to some news coverage. So I think it's an appropriate request and I will ask it of the group in general first and then we'll go from there. And, and I will ask it in general terms. So I will inquire if they have been exposed to any news coverage about an event in Louisiana on Thursday night. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. And I've compiled some media reports um, that we printed off from online sources as well as some video clips, um, many, not all of which, but many of which reference our case. If I may just tender them to the court as court exhibits. Have you shown it to the prosecution? I have. I've given them a copy, yes. Okay, great. Okay. All right. What court exhibit is it? I believe we are up to CTR-108. 108? Okay. And 109. So I labeled all of the print, the articles that we printed from the, from online sources, 108, and then the disc that has, contains several clips, and I, and I labeled that 109. Okay, thank you. If I may, may I approach your yes. staff? Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, let's uh, bring the jury in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is now present in the courtroom. Good morning, folks. How was your weekend? Good. It was great for somebody, good for the rest of you. It's good to have you back. Before we start today, I need to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands. The question is whether anyone has been exposed to news coverage of an event in Louisiana on Thursday night. And a bunch of you. Keep your, keep your hands up for just a moment, please, so that I can take down. Okay, in the top row, lift them all the way up. Okay, in the top row, I have, let's see, your number 17, 329. And once I, I call your number, you can put your hand down. So 17, 329. Um, then 661, um, 87. In the second row, I have 1009, 118, 155, and 673. And in the bottom row, I have um, 706 and 737 and a couple more. I've got also 307 and 557. All right, thank you. Uh, folks, I need to follow up with, with uh, those of you who raised your hand. And I can't do it in front of the whole group, so what I'm going to do is send you back to your jury rooms and then bring you in one by one, okay? So we're going to take another short break. Uh, please make sure you follow my admonishments during the break. They all apply. Uh, and then uh, I thank you in advance for your patience. All right? Thank you. All right, the record should reflect that the jury has now exited the courtroom. Uh, Ms. Nelson, uh, your request was to have me question uh, these jurors individually, the 12. I showed 12 people who raised their hand. I showed 17, 329, 661, 87, 1009, 118, 155, 673, 706, 73, 307, and 550. Seven. So what, what are you specifically requesting that the court inquire about? Uh, so under Harper, the inquiry should be to ascertain how much they know of the distracting publicity and what effect, if any, it has had on the juror's ability to decide the case fairly. So I think we need to know the nature of what they've been exposed to, whether any of that coverage included any reference to this case, and whether that has had any impact on their ability to be fair and partial in this case. Now we talked about fair and impartial before and my recollection was that you had objected. So are you asking that I inquire about whether they can still be fair and impartial? Yeah. Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Our objection to that issue arose within the context of a specific jury instruction with specific language in a specific context. So we have no objection to the court inquiring whether um, it has had any impact on the juror's ability to remain fair and impartial in this context. 
And for the record, I think that's an appropriate inquiry. If we're going to do this inquiry, I think that is the question is whether they can be fair, they can still be fair and impartial in these proceedings. Do the people have a position on the uh, request? The, the defense is requesting, in essence, three questions. One, how much the jurors have been exposed to. Two, did it include any reference to this case? And three, has it had any impact on their ability to be fair and impartial in these proceedings? We don't object to those questions, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. All right, let's start with 17, please. Bring juror number 17 in first. The record should reflect that juror number 17 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. Good. I brought you in because you're one of the folks who raised your hand, or who raised their hand when I asked uh, the question a moment ago. Right. Uh, and so I have some follow-up uh, questions for you. The first follow-up question that I have is, uh, I, I'm interested in knowing uh, how much uh, news coverage you were exposed to. Can, can you give me a sense? Was, yeah. it, was it just a little bit brief, or was it a lot? It was extremely brief. I um, I worked all day Friday when we as soon as we got off I uh, went right straight to work and then Sunday I worked all day too and uh, Saturday I tutored insurance all day so uh, I really have not I virtually watch no news anyway but I did happen to hear just the you know introduction that there was a, a theater shooting and. As soon as I heard that, I went to shut it off, and uh, it was on the TV when I was getting ready. And I think it might have been, I don't remember what it was, I'm thinking it might have been Friday morning, if it had happened by then. Okay. And so, anyway, but I heard virtually nothing about it other than that. Um, I don't even know who was injured or killed or any of that. And I don't know where in Louisiana it was, but I did hear it was in Louisiana. So that was the only exposure you had to That work. was the only exposure. That's the only TV I watched all weekend long. Okay. It's starting Friday morning. I don't think I watched any other than that. Great. Mm -hmm. And uh, since Friday, when you were last here, uh -huh. have you received any information about the case from an outside source, about this case from an outside source? No. No? Okay. Nothing about any cases or any, really, any news whatsoever. I have, was extremely busy from the time I left here till this morning when we came in. That brief information mm -hmm. that you were exposed to on Friday morning apparently, uh, does that in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings? No, it does not. And are you confident in your answer? Yes, I'm very confident. And you sound confident. Am I reading you correctly? Yes. Okay. Do you have any concerns at all that you wish to talk to me about? No, I don't. Okay. That's like I said, it, it was so brief, and I really don't know anything about it other than the fact that that did happen. Okay. And that's all I know. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Let me have you step out. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 17 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions uh, from the people with respect to juror 17, or is there any other record that the people want me to make, or are there, um, is there a request uh, that the people are making with respect to juror 17, given the record that was just made? No to all three questions, Your Honor. Okay. Same questions for the defense, Ms. Nelson. Any other record that you want me to make with uh, respect to juror 17, or are there any other questions that you want me to ask her, and are there any requests that you're making with respect to that juror? The only thing we might add, Your Honor, both with, with her and all of the other jurors is, have you, did you discuss it with anyone? And then in addition, perhaps an admonishment not to discuss anything about it with the other jurors, because obviously there's a fair number of them who didn't indicate that they knew anything about it, and so should make sure that they know not to talk about it.
And uh, do you want me to also admonish them that they are to avoid any news coverage about that incident? Yes, please. Any objection from the people with respect to those last requests? Okay, let's bring her back in for just a moment, please. The records to reflect that juror number 17 is now back in the courtroom. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Uh, just a couple of follow-up things. Uh, have you discussed this with anyone? No. No. Okay. Would you promise me, will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes. Okay. And then the last thing is, um, I'm going to uh, admonish you or advise you that you should avoid any future uh, news coverage about this incident. And you did the right thing, by the way. As soon as you heard something, mm -hmm. you turned it off. And that was exactly what you were supposed to do. Would you please avoid any future coverage of that event? I think I'll just stop watching TV in general. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's kind of what it takes. I right. think that's the best thing to do. Thank you. Okay, thank All you. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, she can go back and then let's bring in juror number 329 next, please. The records reflect that juror number 329 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised their hand in response to my question. So I wanted to follow up on, on the fact that you raised your hand, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, the first thing I'm interested in is I'm trying to find out uh, how much um, you, you were exposed to, how much news coverage you, you were exposed to. Can you give me a sense? Was it... Uh, just a brief thing, or was it a lot, of, uh, a lot of news coverage that you were exposed to? It was very brief. I heard the words movie theater and shooting, and I left the room. Okay. And when was that? Do you remember? Um, I honestly don't remember. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, you did the right thing. That's exactly what you were supposed to do, so I appreciate you doing that. Um, ha oh, since you were last here on Friday morning, have you learned or heard or seen anything related to this case at all from an outside source? No. No. Um, whatever you heard related to this event in Louisiana, that brief thing that you heard, is that, does that in any way impact or affect your ability to be fair and impartial in these proceedings? No, sir. And you sound confident in your answer. Am I reading you correctly? Correct. All right. Do you have any concerns at all that you want to talk to me about? No, sir. Have you discussed this with anyone in terms of that brief thing that you heard about the Louisiana event? Have you said anything to anyone about that? No, sir. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes, sir. And finally, will you promise me that you will avoid any news coverage related to that event? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 329 has now exited the courtroom. Uh, are there any other questions that the people are requesting that the court ask of juror 329, or is there any other record that you want me to make? Uh, and do you, uh, are, are you requesting uh, that the court take any action with respect to juror 329? The answer is no to all three questions. All right. Same questions for the defense. Ms. Nelson, are you requesting that the court ask this juror any other questions or that I make any additional record? Or are you requesting that I take any action with respect to Juror 329? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Let's bring in Juror 661, please.
I'm gonna I'm gonna call him in this particular order. So maybe we should have him waiting so we don't delay things. So 87 should be next. So 87 should be waiting after this one. Thank you. All right. Uh, the record should reflect that juror number 661 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing okay. How are you? Good. Thank you. Good. I, I brought you in because I want to follow up on uh, you raising your hand in response yes. to the question that I asked a moment ago. Yes. And I just have some follow-up questions for you. Okay. Uh, the first thing I am interested in is finding out how much exposure you had to news coverage of the Louisiana event. And, and so was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure or something? between? It was between? very brief. I haven't been watching much news since this. I just happened to overhear somebody else listening to a news program. And so it was sort of just in passing. Okay. And was it a one-time thing? It was a one-time thing. And, and how, much did you, what, how much did you hear about it? Not a lot. Just that there was, I don't know if I can say it, that there was a shooting in a movie theater in somewhere in Louisiana. I don't, I don't even know which town. Okay. Since you were last here Friday, yes. have you heard or, or seen or in any other way learned any information related to this particular case from an outside source? No, I have not. What brief exposure you had to the Louisiana incident uh, or event, uh, does that in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings? Absolutely not. And you sound very confident in your answer. Oh, yes. Okay. Do you have any concerns at all that you want to talk to me about? Not at all. Uh, did you discuss this with anyone in terms of the, the brief uh, news coverage that you heard about the Louisiana event? I don't think so. Okay. I don't, yeah. You don't think you... I don't think I did. I can't remember specifically that, but I don't think I did. Well, it was just a brief passing. Sorry. Go ahead. What did you say? Oh, it, I just heard, like I said, a snippet in brief passing, so there wasn't really much to discuss with anyone. Okay, thank you. Will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? I promise. Okay. And will okay. you promise me that you will avoid any other news coverage with respect to that event? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 661 has now exited the courtroom. Uh, do the people uh, have a request to have the court inquire any further of this juror or make any additional record? Or are the people requesting that the court, that the court take any action with respect to this juror? No to all three questions, Your Honor. All right. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Are you requesting that I ask uh, juror 661 any other questions? or that I make any further record, or are you asking me to take any action with respect to this juror? No further requests, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Let's bring in juror 87, please. The record should reflect that juror number 87 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing good. Good. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised their hand when I asked a question a moment ago, and I want to follow up with you. I, I just have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, the, the first thing that I'm interested in is finding out how much exposure you had to the news coverage of this uh, incident or event in Louisiana. Uh, was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure? It was a brief thing. It was just my son saying something. Okay. And... Uh, was it a one-time thing or was it more than one time? One time. One time, okay. Um, since you were last here Friday morning, have you in any way learned any information about this case uh, from an outside source? And when I say this case, I'm referring to the proceedings that you're a juror in. Right, nothing. Nothing, okay. Is there anything about uh, the information, the brief information that you heard about the Louisiana event that in any way impacts or affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in the proceedings here in this courtroom? No. And are you confident in your answer to that question? Absolutely. And you, you seem confident. Am I reading you correctly? Absolutely. You're not hesitating? No. All right. Have you discussed this with anyone? 
which this the news coverage of no. the Louisiana the, the little thing that you heard about the Louisiana event no he just he said something and I was getting ready and I just basically blew him off <laughs> sorry <Okay. laughs> will you promise me that you will not discuss this with anyone else swear to God okay and will you promise me that um, you will uh, do your best to avoid any future news coverage of that event in Louisiana S swear to God okay uh, do you have any concerns that you want to talk to me about? No. No. Great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you. The record should reflect that juror number 87 has now exited the courtroom. Mr. Orman, uh, are the people requesting that the court ask any other questions of juror 87 or that the court make any additional record? Or do you have any requests for the court to take any action with respect to this juror? All right, same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Are you requesting that I ask any other questions? Are you uh, asking me to make any other record? And do you have any requests that the court take any action with respect to Juror 87? That the court follow up with her briefly and, and get her to articulate exactly what it is that her son said to her and exactly what it was that she did in response. Okay, let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that Juror 87 is now back in the courtroom. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Uh, I just have a follow-up question, maybe two. Um, what, what is it that you heard from your son about this event in Louisiana? Do you remember? He said it was a, sh a theater shooting, another theater shooting, but I, I didn't want to know, <laughs> okay. basically. That's why I blew him off. Did, did he say anything else? No. No. And did you respond in any way? No. You just blew them off. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the record should reflect that juror number 87 has now exited the courtroom. Ms. Nelson, any other questions that you are requesting the court to ask? Uh, any other record you want the court to make? Or any action that you're asking the court to take with respect to juror 87? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Let's bring in juror 1009, please. The record should reflect that juror number 1009 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank Good. you. All right. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised uh, their hand when I asked a question a moment ago, and I just have a couple of follow-up questions for you, okay? Okay. All right. The, the first follow-up question has to do with me attempting to figure out uh, how much exposure to the news coverage about the Louisiana event you had. How much were you exposed to? Was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure? Um, it was brief. I received and I saw it in an email, the skim that I get and um, as soon as I read it there was a link that actually related to this case so I just stopped reading it. And and was that was it a one-time thing or was it more than a one-time thing? No, it was just one time. So that was your only exposure to the Louisiana event? Yes. And uh, do you remember what it is you, you read or, or learned about it? Mm -hmm. It said um, that there was a shooting in a Louisiana theater which came directly on the anniversary or day after a verdict was read for the James Holmes case, and then I stopped reading it. Okay. Since you were last here Friday, um, have you received uh, or learned any information related to this case other than what you just mentioned uh, just now, that you mentioned just now, have you, have you in any way learned or received any other information from an outside source related to this case since you were last year Friday? No. The information that uh, you learned about the Louisiana event, does it in any way uh, impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. And are you confident in, in your answer? Yes. Okay. And, and you're not hesitating? No. All right. D did you discuss this with anyone? The email that I... No. The information about the Louisiana event? No. I actually um, received it on Friday and I haven't discussed it, so... And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. 
And uh, will you um, also promise me that you will avoid any future news coverage related to that event in yes. Louisiana? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Let me have you step out. Thank you very much for your patience. The record should reflect that juror number 1009 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Do the people have any um, other questions that they would like the court to ask or any other record that they would like the court to make? Or are the people asking the court to take any action with respect to juror 1009? Your Honor, although it occurs to me now that I've seen these jurors come in, that maybe we should like run a, like one of those bleach wipes or some Purell over that microphone because the first juror who was sick was handling it and all these jurors have been. All right, that's a, oh, we, we're, my staff is ahead of you. That staff, Your Honor. They, they are. They usually are a step ahead of everyone. And they also know how I feel about germs, so. <laughs> they make me happy that way. Okay, let's see. The defense, same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Any other questions that you want me to ask juror number 1009? Any other record that you want me to make with respect to juror 1009? And uh, is there any action that you would like me to take with respect to juror 1009? No, thank you, Your Honor. Okay, great. Let's bring in juror number 118, please. The record should reflect that juror number 118 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Okay. All right. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised their hand in response to my question a moment ago, and I have some follow-up questions, just a few. Okay. Um, the first question I have is how much uh, news coverage of the Louisiana event were you exposed to? Was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure? Three words on a crawler across the bottom of the screen that said L.A. theater shooting, and then I changed it. Okay. And you did the right thing. That's exactly what you were supposed to do. Um, since you were last here on Friday, have you in any way learned anything related to this case that you're a juror in from an outside source? No. Uh, the brief information that you saw about the Louisiana event, does it in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. And you seem confident in your answer, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. You're not hesitating? No. Did you discuss that information, the brief information that you saw about the Louisiana event with anyone? No. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes. Uh, and then will you promise me that you will avoid any future news coverage about that event in Louisiana? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 118 has now exited the courtroom. Um, do the people have any other questions that they would like me to ask juror 118 or any other record that they would like me to make? Or are the people requesting that I take any action? No, Your Honor. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Are you requesting that I ask any other questions of juror 118? Are you asking me to make any other record? Or are you um, asking that I take any action with respect to this juror? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. By the way, it occurs to me that um, given that I have asked all of, the, all of the jurors about the Louisiana event, uh, that I should give them all an admonishment related to avoiding any news coverage about that event. So I'm going to plan to do that unless there's any objections. Is there any objection from the people? Of course not, Your Honor. Any objection from the defense, Ms. Nelson? No, Your Honor. Okay, the next person on my list is 155, juror 155. The record should reflect that juror number 155 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised their hand in response to the question that I asked a moment ago. And I have just a couple of follow-up questions for you. Uh, first, I'm trying to figure out how much exposure you had to news coverage about this Louisiana event. Was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure? Yeah, pretty brief. Uh, flipped on the news. I listened to about a minute of it and changed the channel because I figured I shouldn't be watching this. Okay. And what, what do you remember learning about that event? <clears throat> Just that it was a shooting in the theater 
and um, they were talking about the candlelight vigil and I thought well shouldn't be listening to this if it's about a theater shooting so okay a candlelight vigil held with respect to the Louisiana yes. case okay mm -hmm. Um, and you did the right thing, by the way, by turning it to a different channel or, or stop watching that, that coverage. Um, since you were last here on Friday, have you in any way learned any information about this case from an outside source? And when I say this case, I'm referring to the case that you're a juror in. No. The information, the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana event, has it in any way, does it in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. Have you discussed with anyone that brief information you learned about the Louisiana event? No. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes. Uh, and will you also promise me that you will avoid any uh, future news coverage of the Louisiana event. Yes. And by the way, all your answers seem very confident. You're not hesitating in answering any of my questions. Am I right about that? That's true. <laughs> okay. Do you have any concerns at all that you wish to speak to me about? No, I don't. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. The record should reflect that juror number 155 has now exited the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people uh, would like me to ask juror 155 or any other record that the people would like me to make with respect to this juror? Or are the people making any requests in terms of the court taking any action with respect to juror 155? No, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Nelson, same questions for you. Are you requesting that I ask uh, this juror any other questions or that I make any other record? Or are you requesting that I take any action with respect to juror 155? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Let's bring in juror number 673 next, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning to you. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thank you. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised your hand when I asked a question a moment ago. And I just have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, my first question has to do with me trying to get a sense of how much exposure you had to news coverage of the Louisiana event. Was it a brief thing or was it uh, a lot of exposure? Or was it somewhere in between? Uh, I know a bit about it, but... Tell, tell, me mean, what, tell me how you learned about it and what you learned. Uh, off of the news, um, I that the shooter was in his 50s, and there were three people dead, including himself. And when when did you learn about that? Was it over the weekend, or was it before the weekend? Do you remember? Uh, maybe a day or two after it happened. I'm not sure. You're not sure. Okay. Uh, was it a one-time thing, or, or was it the kind of thing where you kept hearing about it um, on more than one occasion? No, just once. You, so, and was it on TV, or on the radio, or on the Internet? On the Internet. I was being dumb. Okay. So you were on the Internet, and then um, to tell me what happened. Um, I, saw the, I saw a link um, for a theater shooting in Louisiana, and not really... Paying or no, I was paying attention. I just wasn't thinking, and I clicked on it and uh, skimmed it. How, how long were you? Did you have the article on your screen? Two minutes, maybe. Two minutes. So, can you tell me what you learned about that event, other than what you've mentioned? That um, that's it. So that it was a, a shooting, and two people or three people were were dead. Is that right? Well, he. I think he. I think it said that he shot two people and then turned the gun on. Gun on himself. And did it mention where the shooting happened? Louisiana. But where specifically? Lafayette. Um, but what type of location? Theater. Okay. Anything else that you learned about it? No. Um, since you were here Friday, have you in any way learned anything about this case? 
that you're a juror in from an outside source? This case? Right, no. the one that you're a juror in. No. No. And uh, the, the information, the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana event, does it in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. Are, are you confident in your answer? Yes. And you're not hesitating, are you? No. Have you discussed the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana uh, event with anyone else? Um, I briefly said something to my husband, and he said, The record should reflect that juror number 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Uh, are there any other questions that the people want me to ask her, or is there any other record that people want me to make with respect to this juror, or are the people asking me to take any action with respect to juror 673? No, Your Honor. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Any other questions that you would like me to ask her? Any other record that you would like me to make with respect to this juror, or are there any actions that you're asking the court to take with respect to juror 673? May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, we are moving to excuse uh, this juror. I think that her exposure and the actions that she took are, are somewhat different than the other jurors that we've heard from so far. First of all, she did violate the court's order not to consume media about any other cases like this that the court specifically gave the jurors on Friday morning. Secondly, she affirmatively sought out information about the case by actively clinking, <laughs> clicking on a link that she saw. Uh, read about the article and then affirmatively brought this up with her husband who then said I don't think you should be talking about this and so we do have some concerns about um, the the nature of, of of her exposure to this event so we would ask to excuse her and I should add that we're making this request pursuant to Mr. Holmes's state and federal constitutional rights to due process fair trial by an impartial jury and a fair and reliable sentencing proceeding, as well as the heightened reliability required by the Eighth Amendment and Article 2, Section 20 of the Colorado Constitution. Do the people have a position, Mr. Orman? Your Honor, th 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 there's no reason to do anything else with this juror. She looked at an article not about this case, and frankly, to say that she violated an order of the court, I, I think that th th that's, that's a lot of a stretch. And then to sort of say to... Um, say that she violated some other rule of this court by saying to her husband, hey, did you hear about this shooting that is completely separated and not related to this case in any way, shape, or form? Uh, it, there is absolutely no ground that is provided by the defense to excuse this juror. So I object to the relief requested by counsel. Well, I did tell them on Friday to avoid any news reports about this case or any, any case like it. So once she saw that this was about a theater shooting, um, she really should have stopped reading. Now, I don't know when she read about this on the Internet because she said maybe a couple of days after it happened. So I'm going to bring her back in. But if, but if it was after Friday when I gave that admonishment, I think uh, she's clearly in violation of that particular admonishment. So uh, let's bring her back in so that I can clarify. All right, the record should reflect that juror number 673 is now back in the courtroom. Good morning again. Good morning. Um, I just uh, need to follow up a little further. Do you remember um, when um, 
exactly it is that you uh, read about the Louisiana event on the internet? Was it after Friday when you were here in court, or was it before Friday when you were here in court? Um, I'm not exactly sure when it happened, so I'm only I'm guessing maybe two days after it happened, a day after it happened. I'm thinking it's before Friday. You thought it was before Friday morning. I think so. Okay, and and. Um, do you remember when you would have mentioned it to your husband? Right after I saw the article, which was at night. At night, okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Let me have you step out again. Thank you. All right, uh, she, her best recollection seems to be that this was before Friday, uh, so it would have been on Thursday, and she said that uh, she would have talked to her husband uh, right after she learned about it, so that too would have been on, on um, presumably on, on Thursday night. Um, if that's when it happened, in terms of her learning information about this case and in terms of her talking to her husband, there has been no violation of, of the court's admonishment. Um, the court's admonishment was not given until Friday. Uh, as I said throughout, I've been telling them to avoid any news coverage about this case. I added on Friday or any case like it uh, because of the Louisiana incident. I wanted to um, get that out there to them in case there happened to be any news about the Louisiana incident. And, and by the way, counsel did not bring this up to the court's attention on Friday. They could have. They did not. Uh, so. Uh, I nevertheless, in an abundance of caution, uh, told the jurors that uh, they should avoid news coverage not only of this particular case, but also of any case like it. So um, I don't have any basis at this time to excuse juror 673 because I don't have any evidence that she has violated my admonishments, any of them. Um, and, and by the way, I think this juror is, for the record, as candid. Uh, a juror as perhaps I've ever had. I mean, this person is uh, very um, open and forthcoming and honest with the court. We've had her in here with respect to a different incident before. I've questioned her before. I think she's extremely honest. And so I believe that when she's telling me uh, what she's telling me, that that's exactly the truth. So let's bring in the next person, please. The next person is juror number 706. The record should reflect that juror number 706 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Very well. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, I brought you in here because you're one of the jurors who raised their hand in yes. response to my question. And I just want to follow up uh, on that. The first follow-up question I have has to do with the amount of exposure that you had to the news coverage about the event in Louisiana, was it a brief thing or was it a lot of exposure or was it somewhere in between? Actually, it was brief. It was Thursday morning as I was getting ready because I was listening to NPR and I even got a remote for my radio and when I heard it, I just I heard about a shooting and then I heard a uh, theater shooting and I just took the remote and, and turned it off. And you did the right thing. That, that's, that was the right thing to do. I think you said Thursday morning. You probably meant Friday morning. Maybe it was. I don't remember what morning it was. If, if the event happened on Thursday night, then would it have been Friday morning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, since, since, was that the only exposure that you had to, to that event, to news coverage of that event? Well... <clears throat> Whenever I would start to hear something, I think there was one other one where they said, uh, we have some information about the shooter, 
And again, I just turned it off. Okay. And that's what I've been doing. Great. And that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, so what information have you learned about that event, or have you told me already in your answers? Well, I, I don't really know how many people were killed or injured. Um, that's about it. I just know there was a shooting, and they... I believe I do, didn't the guy kill himself? Yeah, and then they had some information about him, but that's all I know. I don't know what kinds of information they have about him. I don't know how old he is or what he looks like. Okay. All right, so uh, it was a two-time um, two thing in terms of you learning some news information about it. On two different, right. It was on two different occasions. Right. Okay. Very it brief. Was, very uh, brief. Very brief both times. Yes. All right. And both times on the TV, is that right? No. No, it was uh, the radio, the NPR, NPR. NPR. That's right. I'm sorry. I, no, I like listening to it because they have these special programs, like this morning about the Android um, Android uh, cell phones. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think you mentioned NPR, but I think when you said you clicked it, I was picturing oh. a TV. Oh, yeah, because I have a remote. I bought a remote specifically for the radio after I became a juror. <laughs> okay. Good for you. I appreciate you doing that. All right. Since you were last here on Friday morning, have you in any way learned anything related to this case that you're a juror in in this courtroom? Not at all. Okay. And uh, does the information, the brief information you learned about the Louisiana event in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? Definitely not. And you I see, don't see how. You seem confident in your answer. Yes, sir. You're yes. Not, and you're not hesitating at all? Not at all. Uh, have you discussed the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana incident with anyone? No. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes. And will you also promise me that you will avoid uh, any future uh, news coverage about the Louisiana event? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Your Honor. The record should reflect that juror number 706 has now exited the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people are requesting that the court ask this juror, or is there any other record that people are asking me to make, or is there any action that people are asking me to take? No, Your Honor. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Any other questions that you would like me to ask this juror? Any other record that you would like me to make with respect to this juror? And any action that you're requesting that I take with respect to this juror? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. The next person is 737. And by the way, earlier I said 73. I should have said 737. So the record should uh, stand, the record stands corrected. 737, please. The record should reflect that juror number 737 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised your hand in response to my question. Uh, and I just need to follow up um, with a couple of questions. Uh, the first follow-up I have is related to how much exposure you had to news coverage of the event in Louisiana. Was it a brief thing? Or was it a lot of exposure, or was it somewhere in between? It was just a headline on a, a website. I didn't even click it. Okay. And, and what did you learn about that event? Do you remember what you saw in the headline? I think the headline said there were two people who were killed, and they didn't know how many were injured, and that's all I, that's all I got. Okay. And so then from there, you stopped. Uh, you moved on from that headline. Well, your instruction was to ignore anything that was related to this case or anything like this case. So that seemed kind of like this case. That, that's exactly what my instruction was, and you did the right thing. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, since you were here on Friday morning, 
Uh, have you in any way learned any information about this case that you're a juror in from an outside source? No. Uh, the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana event, has it had any, uh, does it impact or affect uh, your ability to be fair and impartial as a juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? Certainly not. And your answer sounded very confident. Very confident. And you're not hesitating at all? No. Have you discussed this with anyone in terms of the brief information you learned about the Louisiana event? Not at all. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes, sir. Will you promise me that you will avoid any future media coverage or news coverage about the Louisiana event? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have any concerns at all that you wish to speak to me about? No, sir. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. The record should reflect that juror number 737 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people would like me to ask this juror, or is there any other record that people would like me to make with respect to this juror? And is there any request that the people are asking me to, to uh, or is there any action that the people are requesting that I take with respect to juror 737? No, Your Honor. Ms. Nelson, same questions for you. Are there any other questions that you w would like me to ask this juror? Any other record that you would like me to make with respect to this juror? Or is there any action that you are asking me to take related to juror 737? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thanks. Let's bring in juror number 307 next, please. The record should reflect that juror number 307 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning. Hi. How are you? A little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's no reason to be nervous. I just brought you in because you're one of the people who raised your hand when I asked a question a moment ago. And I want to follow up uh, with you uh, with just a couple of questions. Uh, my first question has to do with uh, me attempting to assess how much exposure you had to news coverage of this Louisiana event. Was it a brief thing? Was it a lot of exposure? Or was it somewhere in between? It wasn't actually exposure to media. A friend texted me and said, did you hear about it? And I just said, I can't talk to you about it. OK. What, when did that happen? Um, it was last week sometime. OK. Before the weekend. Before the weekend? Yeah. And do you remember what your friend texted you, what the information was? Um, just did you hear that there was another theater shooting? It, there wasn't any information in it more than that. OK. All right, and you did the right thing, by the way, by telling your friend that you didn't want to talk about that or couldn't talk about that. Um, so it was a one-time thing, and it was very brief. Yes. Uh, since you were last here Friday morning, have you in any way learned anything uh, about this case that you're a juror in from any outside source? No. And does the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana event in any way impact or affect your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. And you seem confident in your answer? Yes. You're not hesitating at all? No. Uh, have you discussed that information about the Louisiana event with anyone? No. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Yes. Will you also promise me that you will continue to avoid any news coverage about that Louisiana event? Yes. Do you have any concerns at all about anything that you want to talk to me about? Um, no, I don't. Great. Thank you very much. The record should reflect that juror number 307 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Uh, are there any other questions that the people would like me to ask this juror? Is there any other record that people would like me to make with respect to this juror? 
Are there, is there any action that people are asking me to take with respect to Juror 307? No, Your Honor. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Any other questions that you would like me to ask Juror 307? Any other record that you would like me to make with respect to Juror 307? Uh, or any action that you would like me to take with respect to Juror 307? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Let's bring in the last juror, 557, please. Good morning. Good morning. The record should reflect that juror number 557 is now present in the courtroom. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Good. I brought you in because you're one of the people who raised your hand when I asked a question a moment ago, and I wanted to follow up on that. Uh, and I just have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, my first question uh, has to do with how much exposure you had with the news coverage about the Louisiana event. Was it just a brief thing? Was it a lot of exposure, or was it somewhere in between? Uh, it was very brief. Tell me about that. When did it happen and how many times did it happen? Uh, we were actually in Steamboat for the weekend. Um, I was getting ready in the morning. My husband went out to get coffees and came back and just said to me that there's been another theater shooting. So, so you didn't hear about it from the news. You heard no. about it from your husband. Yes. And so uh, what all did your husband say to you? That's really all he said. He said, um, tell me, tell me exactly what he said. He just said there's been another theater shooting um, in Louisiana, and I think he said two people were killed or something like that, and that was that was it. Did you respond? No. And um, did you have any further discussions with him about it? No. I, I mean, I said it's probably something that we shouldn't talk about. I guess because I've been staying away from the news on purpose. So. Good. That was smart. Yes. Um, since you were last here Friday morning, have you in any way learned anything about this case that you're a juror in from an outside source? No. And the brief information that you learned about the Louisiana event, does it in any way affect or impact your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in these proceedings here in this courtroom? No. And you're, are, you sound confident in your answer? Yes, I am. You're not hesitating at all? No. Um, th this information, brief information about the Louisiana event that your husband mentioned to you, uh, have you discussed it with anyone? No. And will you promise me that you will not discuss it with anyone? Absolutely. Will you also promise me that you will avoid any uh, future news coverage that there may be about the Louisiana event? Yes. Any concerns that you have as you sit here that you want to talk to me about? No, sir. No? Not. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Right. The record should reflect that juror number 557 has now exited the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people would like me to ask of juror 557? Any other record that the people would like me to make with respect to juror 557? And are the people making any requests in terms of me taking any action with respect to that juror? No, Your Honor. Same questions for you, Ms. Nelson. Any other questions that you would like me to ask Juror 557? Any other requests that you would like me to make of Juror 557? Um, or, excuse me, any other record that you would like me to make with respect to Juror 557? And any action that you would like me to take with respect to that juror? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right, great. Thanks. All right, in that case, I'm going to bring all the jurors back in and we'll get going. Is that okay with the parties? Yes? You ready to go? Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. Thank you.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is now back in the courtroom. Uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. I very much appreciate that. Um, I, I asked a question at the beginning of the morning session and um, about a Louisiana event, and, I, and I've asked follow-up questions of some of you. Uh, I want to give you a, a new advisement, and that, it, that applies to all of you, and that is to avoid any news coverage uh, about the Louisiana event. So uh, that includes not only those of you who had already uh, gotten uh, brief information about it, but those of you who had not heard it, have not heard anything about it. Avoid any news coverage of that uh, event, okay? All right. At the end of the day on Thursday, the defense was still presenting evidence uh, related to mitigation, and so let me inquire at this time of the defense to see if they wish to uh, present additional evidence. Ms. Brady, who's your next witness? Dr. Jeffrey Metzner. All right. Doctor, good morning again. Good morning. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please be seated. Doctor, I know that you uh, previously testified in this trial, but it's been a while, so I'm going to ask you to uh, reintroduce yourself by stating your full name and spelling your first, middle, and last names, okay? Jeffrey Lee Metzner, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-L-E-E-M-E-T-Z-N-E-R. Ms. Brady, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, as the, the judge stated, um, the jury will probably recall you testified before in this case. Is that correct? That is accurate. And you recall that that was back on June 8th of this year? Yes. And uh, you were called to the stand uh, by the prosecution? Correct. And uh, Mr. Brockler asked that you be qualified as an expert? Correct. You... Um, provided uh, us with a, a copy of your CV, uh, your curriculum vitae on that day, and it was admitted into evidence. Do you recall that? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach and get P-TR-1226, please? Yes. And show it to Dr. Metzner? Yes. Doctor, is that a, a copy of your curriculum vitae? It is. And uh, as before, it still contains all of your education and background and experience in the area of psychiatry and <coughs> forensic psychiatry? Yes. Um, as contained on your, on your CV, uh, you, you have your office here in Colorado, is that correct? Yes and you do work with the Colorado Mental Health Institute in Pueblo? Yes. Which is also called the State Hospital or the State Mental Hospital? Yes. Do you recall that the court previously uh, qualified you as an expert to render opinions in the area of psychiatry and forensic psychiatry? I do. Your Honor, may Dr. Metzner still be allowed to render opinions in those areas? Any objection? Oh, Your Honor. Okay, with that objection, he will be allowed to render expert opinions in the areas of psychiatry and forensic psychiatry. And members of the jury, I'll give you the instruction that I've been giving you throughout with respect to expert testimony, and that is that you're not bound by the testimony of a witness who testifies as an expert. The credibility of an expert's testimony is to be considered as that of any other witness. You may believe all of an expert witness's testimony, part of it, or none of it. Uh, the weight that you give the testimony is entirely your decision. You may proceed, Ms. Brady. Thank you. 
Uh, doctor, prior to this case, had we ever met before? I don't believe so. Had you ever met Mr. King? No. Had you ever met any member of the defense team? Uh, no. Okay. Had you ever met any member of the prosecution team? I don't believe so. Were you hired by either side, the prosecution or the defense, to do your work in this case? I was not. Um, were you appointed by the court? I was appointed by the court on the recommendation of the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Pueblo. So was it the hospital, Colorado Mental Health Institute, uh, was, it, was it that facility or the people there who decided that the doctor would be you? Yes. Okay. Did either side, the prosecution or the defense, have anything to do with you being chosen in this case? Neither side did. Has either side paid you any money for your work in this case? No. Who pays you for the work that you do in this case? The state hospital. Now, uh, one, one of your uh, assignments from the judge in this case was to evaluate, as we heard before, whether Mr. Holmes was sane or insane on July 20th. Correct. Uh, was a, another um, order from the court that you uh, evaluate Mr. Holmes for mitigating factors related to mental disease or defect? Yes. Okay. That is primarily what we'll be discussing today, okay? Yes. As part of your evaluation and what you've already testified to, uh, to this jury is that um, Mr. Holmes did suffer from a mental disease or defect. Yes. I'd like you to explain to the jury again, if you can, uh, just to, to refresh their recollection, um, your opinion and why you formed that opinion uh, that Mr. Holmes suffered from a serious mental illness on July 20th of 2012. Well, as you recall, I reviewed voluminous discovery material. Uh, prior to my examination, I reviewed about 55,000 pages of discovery. Since that time, I've reviewed uh, another 40,000 pages. In addition to that, uh, I interviewed Mr. Holmes. I believe it was on four occasions for a total of 25 and a half hours during August of 2013. Prior to my interviewing uh, Mr. Holmes, I also contacted by telephone all the mental health clinicians who had had some form of contact, whether it was for forensic evaluation or whether it was for treatment either at the Arapahoe County Jail or Denver Health Medical Center since July 2012. And I believe that was about nine psychiatrists um, and uh, at least two psychologists in addition. And those people included other evaluating uh, experts. I also reviewed psychological tests. Um, I also talked with his parents as well. Um, and as you've heard me testify, I also uh, observed Dr. Reed's uh, videotaped examination as well as read uh, the transcript of, of that uh, examination. Okay. And um, based on all of that, on everything you did, um, is it your opinion that Mr. Holmes suffers from a serious mental illness? That is my opinion. Did he suffer with a serious mental illness before July 20th of 2012? Yes. Did he suffer a serious mental illness on July 20th of 2012? Yes. And has he suffered from a serious mental illness after July 20th of 2012? Yes. Can you um, explain to the jury what you mean by serious mental illness? What I mean by a serious mental illness is it's a mental disorder that's 
characterized at least intermittently by psychotic features, meaning there's significant problems in reality testing, being able to tell what's real and what's not real, and that it's associated um, with significant functional impairments. Can you um, remind the jury what it was you uh, diagnosed Mr. Holmes with? Well, I, I formulated a differential diagnosis. Um, and again, just to remind you, I said before, a differential diagnosis is the possible diagnosis that could account for his symptoms. And the, the differential diagnosis that I formulated was schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, uh, social anxiety disorder, uh, trichotillomania. And then I also had testified among that differential diagnosis, I thought the most likely diagnosis uh, was a schizoaffective disorder in addition to the trichotillomania and the social anxiety disorder. Is schizoaffective disorder any less serious than schizophrenia? No, they, they are both equally um, significant, serious, chronic, persistent disorders. And is schizoaffective disorder really, you take schizophrenia and add a mood component or a depressive or manic uh, disorder to that? In essence. And um, did you find uh, that Mr. Holmes also suffered from a depressive mood component in addition to the characteristics of schizophrenia? Yes, that's why I made the diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. Did uh, the role of biology or genetics in any way enter into your diagnosis? Yes. Um, as I previously testified, if you look at Mr. Holmes' family history, uh, he's what is referred to as genetically loaded for serious mental disorder. He has a paternal aunt who has a schizoaffective disorder and both grandfathers, grandfathers on both sides of the family had uh, significant mental disorders that required hospitalization and was associated with significant functional impairments. Did you and do you believe that Mr. Holmes suffered from uh, delusions on July 20th of 2012? Yes, and as I had previously testified, I believe that his actions on July 20th of 2012 were directly related to his delusional thinking uh, about the human capital and increasing his self-worth. Do you, um, is it your opinion that Mr. Holmes um, has suffered from negative symptoms? Yes. Can you explain that to the jury? Yes, I had described negative symptoms in the past as being characteristic of schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia as well, to include elogia, elogia paucity of speech, flat affect, um, a, a volition, lack of motivation, um, trying to think the uh, missing one. Um, let me refer to my notes and refer to my report. If that'll refresh recollection. Yes, I'll give you a page number in a minute. I'm looking at page 52. Two others I left out, um, anhedonia, which is decreased ability to enjoy things that used to be enjoyable to you, and asociality, which is lack of interest in social interactions. And in the spring of 2012, uh, through your, your reading and uh, consulting with people, uh, was, is it your opinion in the spring of 2012, um, Mr. Holmes was suffering from those negative symptoms? Yes. 
So even before July 20th of 2012. Correct. Given that he was delusional, is it your opinion that he is therefore psychotic? Yes. If, if By definition, if you're delusional, th that's a psychotic symptom. And what was the first evidence that you could find that Mr. Holmes uh, had that delusion? First evidence, as I previously testified, was the March uh, Gmail chat with uh, Gargi. And I... I I think it was March 25th or 26th. And uh, anything concerning his visits with Dr. Fenton that also led you to believe that Mr. Holmes was psychotic? Well, <laughs> throughout Dr. Fenton's notes, um, she raises concerns in her differential diagnosis of whether there was an underlying psychotic process. So was it significant to you that another psychiatrist also had concerns that he may be psychotic? Yes. What about the notebook? Well, the, the, as I previously testified, the notebook and the Gmail chat were very uh, important sources of information for me. And... Uh, although there's clearly very organized writing in the notebook, there's also very psychotic writings in the notebook, and particularly at the beginning of the notebook um, where he starts talking about uh, essentially the, the human capital delusion. And you found that to be evidence of psychosis? Yes. Uh, what about the November 2012 visit to the Denver Health Medical Center? Well, that was also very important. Uh, the, the November hospitalization, uh, Mr. Holmes was clearly psychotic. He also had, in addition to psychosis caused by his underlying mental disorder, he also had a delirium. Um, but it was also consistent with my diagnosis of a schizoaffective disorder or a serious mental disorder that you saw a later course of his illness uh, manifested more floridly. Now, have you seen the video of Mr. Holmes in the jail cell? I have. In November of 2012? Yes. Okay, the jury has as well. Can you tell us if, if what we see in that video is a seriously mentally ill person? Yes, I think his, what you see in that video was consistent with symptoms of a serious mental illness. How sick does someone have to be to smear feces around the room? You... There's, you know, I, because of my work in prisons, there's, you, you see two kinds of feces smears. It's, it's sort of sad that I can be classify that, but I have that experience. And there's two types. There's one person who is not mentally ill at all and is doing it to annoy other people. And then there's other people who are psychotic and who are significantly regressed. And it's uh, just uh, another manifestation of a serious mental illness. In my opinion, uh, Mr. Holmes' fecal smearing was clearly related to psychosis and not to a non-psychotic uh, action. Same with licking the walls of that cell. Same question. Yes. You, you, I, I haven't seen people fake licking walls. Um, so I would say that's also consistent with the serious mental illness. How about uh, doing a somersault with a styrofoam cup balanced on his penis? You know, that, that was bizarre behavior, and I think that bizarre behavior is symptomatic of his illness. Do you have any doubt that in uh, November of 2012, Mr. Holmes was severely psychotic? Um, I'm not sure I understand the uh, objection. Do you want to approach? Sure. Yes, All right. 
the objection is sustained, but uh, Ms. Brady, you may rephrase. Within a reasonable degree of psychiatric certainty, was Mr. is it your opinion that Mr. Holmes was severely psychotic in the jail in November of 2012? That is my opinion. Was it also significant to you that uh, doctors from Denver, Denver Health Medical Center also uh, did a differential diagnosis of psychosis, not otherwise, otherwise specified? Yes. So again, other uh, professionals in the field um, suspecting that Mr. Holmes was psychotic. Sustained. Was that significant to you, that other professionals suspected he was psychotic? Yes. How about the psychological testing that you asked to be done at the Colorado Mental Health Institute at the State Hospital? Did that factor into your diagnosis of, of Mr. Holmes? The, the testing was consistent with my diagnosis. And that was testing done by Drs. Gray and Manguso? Yes. Since November of 2012, as you're aware, uh, Mr. Holmes has been on antipsychotic medication. Can you explain to the jury what antipsychotic medi medicine does for someone who has schizoaffective disorder? Antipsychotic medication has in, impacts the neurochemistry of your brain and corrects some of the and this is in very simplistic terms, correct some of the imbalances in your neurochemistry to make you less psychotic. Some people, it'll make them, no, it'll put their psychosis in remission. Other people, it'll make them less psychotic, although they may still remain with sim symptoms. Does it ever cure the disease? There, there are a small percentage of people who, after many years, won't need medications. Uh, most people are going to need medications for life, and in general, you don't look at the medications as a cure, but help to stabilize and control people, control symptoms, not control people, control symptoms. And if, if someone has negative symptoms um, and they take antipsychotic medication, does that make the negative symptoms any different, or will those remain? Why would someone remain very quiet after starting these medications? Well, negative symptoms are a little harder to treat. And um, it will have variable impact on the negative symptoms. So those symptoms may still remain the asociality, the lack of motivation, the lack of a lot of speech? Correct. Is it common for someone with schizoaffective disorder to display inappropriate emotional uh, emotions? If, if they're either untreated or, you know, sometimes you're treated and you still have exacerbations or increase in your symptoms. So, yeah, that's not uncommon to see. And even though it was your opinion uh, that Mr. Holmes could tell the difference be between right and wrong. Do you feel that his mental illness played any role in the shootings on July 20th of 2012? Yes, it's my opinion, as I previously expressed, that uh, Mr. Holmes' actions were directly related to his mental illness and specifically uh, were directly related to his delusional thinking and that but for his mental illness with that particular delusional thinking, uh, it's my opinion that he would not have done what he did. Is it fair to say that you feel like his mental illness played a very major role on July 20th? Um, sustained. Did his mental illness play a major role on July 20th based on what you just said? Yes. What about, um, you've read and talked to Mr. Holmes about this uh, hatred of mankind. Did that play a role in the shooting of July 20th? To the extent that it played a role, it was a very minor role. 
he, um, he, he had that hatred of mankind, whatever that hatred of mankind was, for a long time. And as I previously testified, the issue was, well, so why is he doing something like this now? And in my opinion, the reason he was doing something like this now is he w developed a delusional belief and he was psychotic. And that was the driving force, not his hatred of mankind. How about uh, some sort of need for notoriety? As I previously testified, I don't think this had to do with uh, request, trying to get publicity or getting notoriety. Why do you think that? Well, I think that for a number of reasons. Um, the first one is uh, there's a saying in medicine when you hear hoofs pounding, uh, look for horses, not zebras. And so the, the, clear, th the, the clear motivating factor was his psychosis and his delusional beliefs. Uh, that's why I say that. And, and on my examination and talking with him, I don't get evidence that there was a primary drive for notoriety. What about uh, the breakup with his girlfriend? The, the breakup of his girlfriend did not cause him to do this. Uh, as I previously mentioned, then previously testified, the question was, why was he psychotic now? And I said, well, one possibility is there are a number of triggers that if you're predisposed to uh, psychosis, sometimes when you're under stress, uh, significant stress, that could uh, precipitate the psychosis. So I talked about three triggers before, uh, which included the, uh, the breakup with his girlfriend, the realization that going to graduate school wasn't going to um, fix his brain, and the, the increasing perception that his performance in school was, in graduate school, was not going to be like his performance in college or high school. And so I said, those three factors could have triggered his psychosis. And I said, also, that it's possible that those factors had nothing to do with triggering his psychosis. And it could have been the natural history of the, the illness because he was at the right age for when you first see uh, manifestations of schizophrenia or schizoaffective. So even if he hadn't broken up with his girlfriend or even if he had uh, done better in school, he may still have had this psychotic break. Correct. Or it could be that those stressors contributed to the timing of his psychotic break. That's accurate. And the psychosis caused the shooting. Correct. And there, is there any way for you to know which one of those two scenarios it is? No. Was there uh, anything in what Mr. Holmes said to Dr. Fenton uh, that made you suspect what, you know, you were asking the question, why now? Why did he uh, start having these delusions now? Anything in his conversation with Dr. Fenton uh, that, that helped you form an opinion on that? I don't recall in my conversations with Dr. Fenton that gave me a clue of why now. Uh, how about Mr. Holmes saying that he lost his fear once he started seeing Dr. Fenton? Okay, so that goes back to what I had testified before about the reviewing the notebook with him, reviewing medications with him. Mr. Holmes had said that once he started Zoloft, that at least by his notebook, that's when he began experiencing some manic-like symptoms. That's also when he began um, losing his fear about acting on these plans. Um, 
and the reason that's not something that I got from Dr. Fenton, that was something that I got from talking with Mr. Holmes from reviewing line by line in the notebook. And, and did he tell you that he felt that the medication made him symptomatically worse? Yes. Is it possible that the medication, for a short period of time at least, made him feel worse? It's, it's possible for a short period of time it made him feel worse, but as I've previously testified, his delusion was not due to the medication and his illness wasn't due to the medication, but it's conceivable that for a brief period of time his symptoms could have gotten worse. You uh, felt that Mr. Holmes had an autistic-like quality. Can you explain that to the jury? In, in his way of relating to other people, that, um, you know, people, you've heard testimony of people saying that he was shy and introverted. Um, and to say autistic-like just means it's even more severe than shy and introverted. Do different people exhibit symptoms of mental illness differently? Of course. So if we see the way one patient uh, exhibits signs of symptoms of mental illness, it could be different than the way another person exhibits their signs and symptoms. Yes. Can you compare what, you know, people to people and expect to find exactly the same, or is it natural to find differences among uh, people suffering from this type of mental illness? Well, there, there's clearly some commonality. So, for example, um, it's not uncommon for people who are psychotic to experience auditory hallucinations, that is, hearing voices that other people don't hear. But there's a whole range of the type of voices people hear, the content of the voices, the frequency of the voices. So, yes, there's some common things, but it's expressed very, can be expressed very differently. And uh, what about delusions? Do, do people have all, of, all the same type delusions? Do people choose their own delusion? How does that work? No, I previously testified you can classify delusions into certain categories such as grandiose delusions or uh, paranoid delusions and there's a couple other categories and then there's the category of other which means you have a delusion that doesn't fit into any of these other categories and people don't pick their delusions and um, it just happens. All right. Is it your opinion uh, that Mr. Holmes's mental illness was disturbing and distressing to him? Yes. How much so, do you think? Oh, I think it was uh, very disturbing to him and very... You will also, just to remind you, I think that this is the reason he went to graduate school in neurosciences. He had a sense that there was something wrong with him and he was hopeful that uh, if he learned about the brain he would be able to fix it. Is, is this mental illness something that he chose? No. Did he do something wrong and got this mental illness? No. You have heard and know that, that he's uh, quite intelligent uh, can being intelligent ward off mental illness? No. Is it somehow a character flaw? The mental illness, the mental illness is not a character flaw. It's, you know, it's the luck of the draw. You can get cardiac disease, you can get hypertension, you can get mental illness. N none of us yeah, choose to get those things. Did you uh, find that there were some clear mitigating factors related to Mr. Holmes's mental illness? Yes. Can you uh, talk to us about Mr. Holmes's appreciation for the wrongfulness of his actions and explain to us how it was 
the, the, uh, how you can distinguish between the, the legal definition of sanity and what uh, you mean by a mitigating factor related to his mental illness. So similar to what I testified previously, I think that Mr. Holmes's actions on July 20th were a direct result of his mental illness. The reason that it was my opinion that he did not meet criteria for legal insanity is because he, it was in my opinion that he was able to, he had the capacity of distinguishing the difference between right from wrong. And I previously said that that's a very narrow definition in, of, it's a very narrow definition that most people with serious mental illness, with serious symptoms, don't meet the definition of legal insanity. And I had previously testified that the opinion I gave the but for, that but for his mental illness, he wouldn't have done this, that this was a causation opinion, not a sanity opinion. And I had, and so it's my opinion that his mental illness significantly impaired his capacity for telling it, for knowing the wrongfulness of his actions, despite having the capacity to know the difference between right from wrong. And I've been thinking about this, and there's really two examples I think I can give that gives you some sense of that. I previously had talked about when someone is intoxicated, and I talked about alcohol, but you could be intoxicated from drugs or alcohol and know the difference between right from wrong, but because of that, the cognitive impairments, you could demonstrate impaired judgment in your actions. So you could know that something's wrong, but because your judgment is impaired, you, you might either not care or think that it's not going to uh, happen to you. And the reason that's not a great analogy for someone who's mentally ill is for two reasons. One, most people who are impaired from intoxication chose to become in intoxicated. They either took the drug or they took the alcohol. The second reason is not all, but most people when they're impaired from intoxication have an awareness that they're acting differently and um, that their judgment is impaired and that's why you actually see people, why we have designated drivers and sometimes you're impaired but you know you need a designated driver and other times uh, you're so impaired that your friends have to tell you that. But I think the other analogy that I've thought about is if you think about someone who has dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, and there's a wide range of impairment with that. Think about someone who has dementia that it doesn't take a physician to make that diagnosis, that you know that this person is impaired. That's, that's similar, the, that level of impairment is similar in my opinion to the level of impairment that Mr. Holmes has in the following ways. One, the person with dementia generally is not aware that there are the levels of impairment. And, and so that's their normal life. And, and they need some outside structure. And the person with dementia hasn't chosen that. And it's not something that they can think to themselves, well, when this wears off, I'm going to be okay. It's the same thing with the kind of mental illness that Mr. Holmes has with this delusional thinking. This delusional thinking, it's not something that he can say to himself or think to himself what's well, going to go away when he, uh, this intoxication goes away. It's, it's part of his thinking. And, he, um, and it's also something that he hasn't chosen. And the reason that I say that his actions were a direct result of his mental illness I can come up with no other explanation for what he did other than it's directly related to um, his delusion and his mental illness 
impacted his judgment so poorly that he did something that he knew that he had the capacity to know was wrong. So um, even if he had the capacity to know it was wrong, is it your opinion that his appreciation for the wrongfulness of his actions uh, was significantly impaired by his psychosis? That is my opinion. Uh, was it your opinion uh, that Mr. Holmes's depression and psychosis was a cause of um, sort of psychiatric duress to him? And can you explain that to the jury? Yes, I, I think that part of the impairment, and the two are very related, is his, his depression and his psychosis. And, and that 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 caused him to have impaired judgment from a clinical sense. Um, what about his description of like this had to be done, and that once he once he told someone about it, this is something that had to be done, and you know he sort of set everything aside to make sure that this mission, this killing at the theater, got done. Can that? Do you see that as sort of a, a psychological stress or a psychological duress on Mr. Holmes? Well, you know, the, the had to be done comes, doesn't come from my interview. A and that, that's not a strong basis for, for my opinion. My, my opinion is that he had delusional thinking. Um, you know, most people with delusional thinking, fortunately, don't act on their delusions. Yeah, he acted on his delusions, and I think gives a reflection of the severity of his illness. Um, so I put more on his very poor reality testing, his depression, and, and this bizarre delusional thinking that led to this. Uh, I have less of an opinion about it had to be done. What, what does uh, the mental illness do around July 20th? What did his mental illness uh, do to his emotional state at that time? Well, you know, my previous testimony, I talked about Mr. Holmes trying to make the shooting impersonal. And I, and I gave examples of how I think he tried to make it impersonal. And I, and I think that was related to his psychosis and his delusional thinking. What, what about his uh, texting back and forth with Hir Hillary Allen when he says, floodgates open now? Did that speak at all to you about his emotional state around that time? Yes, I I'd previously testified that the floodgates are open was a reflection to me of how overwhelming his illness was to him at that point. Miss Brady, I'm sorry, is this a good time to take our morning break? I have one more question. Oh, okay. If All that right. helps you. you yes, know. that helps me. All right. We'll wait. <laughs> Thank you. One more question, doctor. Uh, in your opinion, did mental illness significantly affect Mr. Holmes's functioning in the spring and summer of 2012? Yes. And can uh, you tell us how significantly you, you feel that his functioning was impaired? Well, his functioning was so impaired that he thought it was an acceptable idea to plan a mass murder and kill people and, and think that that was okay to do. And, and uh, you know, I've testified earlier that his actions weren't the result of an antisocial personality disorder. Um, it was the result of a serious mental illness. Thank you. All right, members of the jury, uh, we've been at this for a little over two hours, so I need to give uh, Ms. Trojanic and the rest of my staff a break. Uh, please make sure you follow all my advisements during the break. They all apply, and then let's plan to have you back in about 20 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm.